Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus.
now, take a moment and tell the person next to you, he is risen. Greet the people around you this morning. Well, good morning and welcome. Glad you could join us on this Resurrection Sunday. You know, we know from 1 Corinthians 15 that right away, I mean, immediately, there were people who heard the message of the good news and thought, Jesus sounds like a great guy. Lived a praiseworthy life, wise, authoritative teaching. Uh, there's maybe something to be said for this gathering together all as, as the family of God. But the resurrection... No, I mean, that doesn't happen. You know, the dead stay dead. No, one's, no one comes back from the dead. And Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians 15, says, if that's true, then we are to be pitied more than all people. But then he goes on to say, but Christ has been raised from the dead. And even though just as death came through one man, now to life, resurrection will come to all through Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Well, glad you could join us this morning. If you are a guest, if you're someone who's new here, we want to extend a special welcome to you this morning. Uh, my name is Jay. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. And, and we would want to invite you, following the service, just to stop at the welcome desk. Uh, we have someone there who's got a small gift for you on behalf of our church and who would be happy to talk to you about uh, any of the other ministries or things going on at First Free. So if you're new here, we hope you'll take advantage of that. We'd love the chance to talk with you a little bit more. Um, if you flip your bulletin over to the back, we have a couple announcements that we'd like to highlight this week. First, Discovering First Free, uh, which is our class for membership, but you don't have to become a member. It's also just a great way to learn a little bit more about the history and structure of our church as well as our vision and our mission. Uh, so if you've never taken that class, uh, we would encourage you to sign up for that. If you're thinking about church membership, this is a great next step. It'll be during the first hour, the 9 o'clock hour, on April 14th and 21st. Uh, you can sign up online or you can just show up. You can just come. So you don't, it's not, uh, we're not going to kick you out if you haven't signed up ahead of time. Second, if you'll notice about halfway down there, uh, the guy's night out is coming up. That will be Monday, April 8th. So that's a week from tomorrow. Uh, guys, this is a great event for you to invite neighbors, friends, coworkers. Uh, it's, it's a great low-key experience. We really are just going to watch basketball. We're going to play some games, have some snacks. So if you've got someone that God has placed in your life, this is a great opportunity for you to bring them here, uh, for them to get to know other people from church. It might be a great first step toward getting to know Jesus. So we'd encourage you to invite them, and uh, all kids are welcome. Uh, there's a lot of games, food running around, so uh, bring any of your kids. We'd love to have them there for that event as well. Uh, finally, we have a family announcement this week. We have a rose on the organ because last Sunday, March 24th, Ronan Winter Nordell was born to Jack and Ellie Nordell, came in at 10 pounds, 11 ounces. I know. Welcome, Ronan. Indeed, welcome Ronan, and welcome to each one of you this morning as well. I invite you to join me in prayer as we begin. Father God, today we come and we sing Alleluia because of your victory. You are the joy to this world. <laughs> the bells are ringing, the voices are singing as we worship you. You live 
(laughs) and we rejoice. It is truly right and good with our whole heart and mind and voice to praise you, the invisible, almighty, eternal God and your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We celebrate that Christ broke the bonds of death and hell and rose victorious from the grave. How wonderful. And beyond our understanding, O God, is your mercy and loving kindness to us that to redeem us, slaves, you gave your son. So that all who believe in Christ... (laughs) might be delivered from the gloom of sin and restored into fellowship with you by your grace. Lord, we're overwhelmed with that truth today. And we praise your name. We ask that you would just receive our worship this morning. We pray all these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. One of the unique aspects of The Christian faith, when compared to other faiths or other uh, religions uh, or religious movements, is that it traces uh, its uh, origin to one particular event, one particular day in in history. Now, if you think about it, that's not true of Judaism. It's not true of uh, Islam or Buddhism or atheism, for that matter. Um, one day there was no such thing as, um, you know, the Christian church. And then suddenly overnight there was. There was suddenly a group of people who believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and even suffered uh, the most extraordinary things for his sake. And that one thing... (laughs) It was Easter. It's what we celebrate today. The resurrection of Jesus Past four weeks on Sunday mornings, um, we have been walking through the last couple of days, hours of Jesus' life um, as told by uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Um, And this past Friday evening, if you were able to be with us, maybe you were not, but we celebrated what's called Good Friday. And on Good Friday, we focus on the cross and we focus on the price that Jesus paid for our sins on that cross. And can I tell you, (laughs) through this whole series, as we have been walking with Christ to that cross, I have been looking forward to this day, to this day of Easter. Because listen, I, I got to tell you, you can't really appreciate this day. You can't really understand this day until you have been to the cross. You can't appreciate the power of this day and what the resurrection really means until you've experienced a tragedy and darkness and evil that took place on Good Friday. In Jesus Christ, God who created the universe chose to visit um, our planet. <laughs> He came down and became one of us, flesh and bone, um, human feelings, emotions. And then at the age of 30, Jesus began his public ministry. Um, He told people that God's kingdom had arrived and therefore they should repent and they should believe the good news. Um, He healed the blind, the the lame, um, lepers, and he even raised the dead in his three years of ministry and those who followed him knew that there was there had never been anyone like this man Um, and although they believed he was the messiah i gotta tell you they failed to see the twist coming they failed to see that he would die on the cross when jesus died none of his followers (laughs) um, said hey Everything's going perfect according to plans. Um, I mean, none of his followers thought that his death was a, was a good thing. Um, in fact, we're told that it became very clear as they were, uh, uh, as he was getting closer to dying, all the disciples, what happened was they deserted him. 
The picture we get in all four of the Gospels is that his followers were disheartened and dismayed and disappointed and disillusioned and dispirited. And that's where we pick up things this morning um, with the disciples living between Good Friday and Easter Sunday morning. I invite you, if you have your Bibles, or you can take one of those pew Bibles in front of you, maybe a Bible on your phone, you can take a look and, and uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 15. We're going to start at the end of Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 42. This is what Mark writes. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead... He granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, uh, saw where he was laid. Um, I want you to notice two things here uh, in this uh, section of of scripture. Uh, First of all, notice that Jesus was undeniably dead. Okay, Um, significant for us to notice that. Um, Joseph of Arimathea, he he, he goes to Pilate, right? And he asks for the body of Jesus. And what we find here is that the Pilate is surprised. He said, well, why is Pilate surprised? Well, uh, because Jesus died so quickly. Ancient records show that oftentimes those who were crucified, that they would uh, live for two or three days hanging on that cross before they finally died. But Jesus was dead after only six hours hanging on that cross. And so Pilate is surprised. And uh, just to make sure, he does this double check. He confirms it with the centurion. And the centurion, who is responsible for overseeing the execution, um, he assures Pilate, yes, Jesus is dead. He is very, very dead. No doubt about it. Now, I want you to notice the second thing in this passage of Scripture, and it is that nowhere in these verses do you see the disciples, do you? Why not? Where are they? Normally, it would have been a member of uh, the family or some of Jesus' or the person's closest followers that would have asked Pilate for the body. Um, But they don't. Instead, it was Joseph, uh, assisted, as the Gospel of John tells us, by Nicodemus, another member of the great Sanhedrin. So catch this. Do you know how many people attended the funeral of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Mark tells us four. (laughs) There was Joseph, there was Nicodemus, and there were the two Marys who watched from a distance. So we say, well, where were uh, Jesus' disciples? Well, they were in hiding. They were behind locked doors for fear that someone would come along and arrest them and and do to them what they saw done to Jesus. It was the same reason that they fled that night in the garden. Um, It was the same reason that Peter denied Jesus. I mean, they were all terrified. For them, these hours between Good Friday and Easter... I mean, those were very dark hours, very dark times. Uh, All their hopes, all their dreams had been pinned on on Jesus. I mean, they they thought he was the Messiah. They had seen him walk on water and, and still those storms and heal the sick. And their hearts had been changed by listening to his words. But now they wondered, was this all fake news? And they were in shock. They couldn't see how their lives could even move forward from here. Their king was gone. Their hopes were dashed. Their faith was crushed. I mean, (laughs) you think about it. One can become an uh, agnostic or an atheist when they experience this type of event. I mean, that's what they were experiencing. 
on that Friday night and that Saturday as they were living in between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. You understand those feelings, right? I mean, you, you've, you've been there. You know what it's like to live between Good Friday and Easter. You, you've had places in your own personal lives where things seem to become dark and grim. And you couldn't seem to find God anywhere. I mean, I've been with some of you at those times, you know. Divorce, your marriage is falling apart and you wonder, how, how am I ever going to make it through all of this? Or you're facing a job loss. Or the loss of someone who you love. And your hopes become crushed. I mean, you didn't plan on life turning out like this. And you question, God, where are you? You've lived in that painful space between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And that's where the disciples were. Okay? But then came Easter Sunday and the empty tomb. Again, notice here that the disciples were nowhere to be found. They're still in hiding. Look with me, chapter 16, verse 1. When, Sabbath, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, uh, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized him. And they had said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Three women, catch this, they go to the tomb. Okay? Um, they go to the tomb early on Easter Sunday morning, and they find it empty. And do you notice the reactions that they had, Mark tells us here? <laughs> um, alarmed, uh, trembling, uh, astonished, afraid. In fact, Mark's gospel ends at that point. I mean, it seems like a strange way to end a book, doesn't it? It ends not with this great courage and this, this, this great hope, but with trembling and bewilderment and women fleeing in silence. I mean, if somebody uh, made this story up, uh, you, you would say, well, they, they would never end this story this way. That's one of the reasons we can believe <laughs> in the story. Um, in fact, some people tried to make sure that the story didn't end that way. So what they did was they added to the ending here. And you'll find that verses 9 through 20. Um, you can see in the modern translations. But see, I find these women's reactions completely understandable. They were grieving a loved one. Um, they're responding in an honest way <laughs> uh, to the sight of this empty tomb and to the shocking news that Jesus has risen. I mean, they're like you and I, right? Um, they understood that dead people tend to stay dead. <laughs> um, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright wrote, uh, notes this. He says, there were many messianic movements in the first century. In every case, the would-be Messiah got crucified by Rome, as Jesus did. In not one single case do we hear the slightest mention of the disappointed followers claiming their hero had been raised from the dead. They knew better. And why do they know better? <laughs> because dead people don't, ri uh, don't rise. Dead people stay dead. 
But see, the combination of these two facts, the empty tomb and Jesus having risen, they, those two facts overwhelm these women. One without the other wouldn't do. I mean, if it was just an empty tomb, but Jesus didn't appear to anyone, skeptics would have uh, claimed, hey, it was just a case of uh, grave robbery. But see, Jesus did appear. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote uh, just a couple decades later of Jesus' life that the risen Christ had appeared um, to Peter, to the remaining disciples, and then to more than 500 others. And on the other hand, if people had reported that they had seen Jesus, but, this, but the tomb uh, was not empty, the tomb still had Jesus' body in it, uh, skeptics would have just said, uh, well, you're having visions, you're, you're hallucinating. I mean, if the Romans could have produced the body of Jesus, uh, they would have, but they don't. These two facts, the fact of the empty tomb and the fact that Jesus has risen changes everything, everything. Um, I mean, that, that's the problem with facts, Right? They can be terribly irritating and horribly inconvenient, yet impossible to dismiss. I mean, I mean, you know what facts are like, right? There's a fact. I don't like it. I wish it wasn't there. Uh, but <laughs> it's there. What am I going to do with it? Well, I guess I got to accept it. Uh, Paul was a Pharisee. He was offended by Christianity. He was offended by the gospel. He was offended by the fact that they said, hey, what? No more need of a temple? Uh, you don't need sacrifices for sin anymore? That's outrageous. <laughs> but then he met Jesus, raised from the dead. And it didn't matter about his likes or dislikes anymore. It, it didn't matter. See, friends, I got to tell you, we ought to be more sympathetic <laughs> to our skeptical friends. I mean, the resurrection of Christ makes Christianity the most irritating religion on the face of the earth. <laughs> um, why? Because people these days, they decide what they believe by reading it and giving it a, you know, a thumbs up or thumbs down emoji. Um, over the years, I've had people say to me, well, I could never be a Christian. And I say, why? Well, I say, well, uh, they say, well, there's parts of the Bible, see, I, I, don't, I don't like. Um, parts I find offensive. And I usually say, well, then let me ask you just a simple question. Are you saying that because there are parts of the Bible that you don't like, that Jesus couldn't have um, been raised from the dead? I go, no, that, that's not what I'm saying. I say, well, listen, every part of the Bible is important, but would you just for a moment, just put those ethical teachings that you don't like aside for just a minute. And here's the point. If Jesus was raised from the dead, you're going to have to deal with everything in the Bible. But if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, <laughs> I don't know why you're worrying yourself over all the other stuff. See, the fact of the empty tomb, the fact of the resurrection, it changes everything. Not just for Jesus, but for those who, who followed Jesus. Suddenly, as a matter of historical record, this reality of the resurrected Jesus transformed the lives of these disciples. These same men who were in hiding behind closed doors, who were afraid, refused to come out to his funeral, were now in the streets of Jerusalem, spreading the news about Jesus at an enormous cost to themselves. They didn't stop at Jerusalem. <laughs> I mean, they went throughout the whole world proclaiming to everyone that Jesus is the Son of, of God who was crucified, and on the third day he rose. They continued to face difficult times. They, they were arrested and, and, and beaten. All but one of them was put to death for their faith. But listen, they never faced those dark times um, like they had before, because they had seen, they had met the risen Lord. They faced life with hope and confidence and joy and with faith. 
And that's what Jesus' resurrection means to us, is that we can face life with hope and confidence and joy and, and faith. In fact, the message of the, this morning is seen in the angel's words here in verse 6. Look with me. The angel said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Um, in the Greek uh, text, the two verbs was crucified and has risen. Uh, they follow each other with, without a break. So in other words, the angel was saying, The crucified is risen. The crucified is risen. <laughs> On Good Friday, it appeared as though Satan had won. As Jesus hung there on that cross and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It seemed as though evil had the final word. But on the third day, when Jesus rose from the dead, he obliterated all of those things. The crucified is the risen. Jesus had the final word. Listen, sin ultimately does not have power over us. Evil will not ultimately triumph. God is stronger than our denial. God is stronger than our betrayal, stronger than our hate, stronger than death itself. That's the power of the resurrection. It's the defining story in, in, in human history, and it is meant to define your life and how you respond to everything else that you encounter in your life. I mean, you, you turn on the TV, right, and you listen to the, the 10 o'clock news, or you open your news app on your phone, and you read uh, what's going on around the world, and you can become, I mean, face it, pretty discouraged pretty quickly. Globally, you read stories, you know, about those wars in Ukraine and, and the wars in, U in Gaza and the crisis in the U.S.-Mexican border. Every day there seems to be a new hot spot on, uh, going on around the world. You read about terrorism and uh, uh, gangs in Haiti and, and bridges collapsing. There's so many things that are frightening. Things that happen represent darkness and despair and lack of hope in the future. And you can easily get very, very scared and almost have this panic attack. But see, from a Christian perspective, I don't read those stories and listen to them and become terrified. Because here's what I know. Neither rogue uh, nations or terrorism or bridges collapsing have the final word. Jesus will have the final word. And that gives us hope. That gives us courage. It doesn't call us to hide back in the back room or bury our heads in the sand or, or, or stop caring about what's going on. That's not what I'm talking about. Of course we care. But see, we can face those things and events with a sense of confidence and hope and great courage because we know who has the final word. In your personal life, the same reality is true, isn't it? I've been with some of you, and the your world is caving in. Some of you have faced cancer. But let me remind you that cancer does not have the final word. Jesus is the final word. Some of you face financial difficulties, broken relationships, divorce, and you're wondering, how can this all be happening? Um, but you know what? Financial ruin... <laughs> is not the final word. Broken relationships is not the final word. Divorce is not the final word. Jesus is the final word. Then, of course, there's that which seems to be the final word. Death, right? <laughs> but the resurrection reminds us once again, death is not the final word. Jesus Christ is the final word. There's a story about a group of tourists who are visiting the Louvre in Paris, and in their tour through that famous art gallery, they came across this painting entitled Checkmate. In it, Foss King is held in checkmate by his opponent. The tourist group continues on through their tour through that art museum, but one of the group <laughs> stays behind. 
That man who stays behind, he paces back and forth, back and forth in front of that painting. Ten minutes later, all of a sudden, the peace and quiet of that gallery is shattered as they hear their forgotten companion cry out, It's a lie! It's a lie! The king has another move! (laughs) The man who had been left behind evidently was a Russian international chess champion, and he could see the move that others had failed to notice. The same thing is true when it comes to the king of kings and lord of lords. Although Satan had figured it was all over, that he had Jesus in checkmate, the king had another move. Good Friday was not the end. On Easter Sunday, Jesus Christ had the final word. So simply, let me ask you this this morning. What story or what truth defines your life. Are we all accidents just, you know, floating around here on this little rock out in space? Um, you live a while, you, you hope uh, to have some, some fun and, and laughter, maybe a, a heartache or two, and then you die and that's it? Or do you define your life by the truth That God is who created the universe, who knows you by name, who loves humankind, who is willing to suffer and die on the cross to redeem us from that dark and sinful uh, world and who finally was raised from the dead to say, you don't have to be afraid because I will always, always have the final word. You see, I, I got to tell you, you have a choice to make. And this morning, if you haven't made that decision to find your life by the truth of Christ's resurrection, then I want to invite you to make that decision today. What it takes is simple yet life changing prayer God, forgive me of my sins. I need you. I give you my life and my heart. I want to belong to you and I want to follow you. Amen. This morning, we're going to have an opportunity to celebrate someone who's made that decision through baptism. I want to remind you that baptism doesn't uh, save somebody. It's not a means of salvation. No, baptism, rather, baptism is is simply a demonstration of what has happened externally. uh, is a demonstration externally of what's happened internally in a person's life. That they have said yes to being on Jesus' team. And so this morning, we need to celebrate with someone who has said, yes, I want to belong to and follow Christ. Let me tell you, sometimes I've been asked after a service like this, sometimes I have been asked, do you really believe this stuff that you keep talking about? Do you really believe all of these things that you're talking about on Easter Sunday morning? And I want to tell you, not only do I believe it, but I'm counting on it. So can you. Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the truth of your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that you came, die on the cross, to give your life so that we might have life. Lord, in response to the truth that you have risen, we praise your name. We celebrate you. Those moments and times when we face trials and difficulties, when we're tempted to doubt and become fearful, when Satan wants to yell, checkmate, remind us that's all a lie, that you have the final word. Thank you for your victory, which we celebrate this morning. In your son's precious name, amen. Well, in a few weeks after... Uh, after the resurrection, uh, when Jesus is on the verge of ascending to heaven to share the throne with his Father, the throne of all creation, uh, he gives some final instructions to the disciples, to his followers. Uh, We sometimes call it the Great Commission. Uh, But what he says is, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Uh, Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations. And then what does he say? Baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Uh, Jesus essentially tells his disciples, uh, I have been made king over all creation. 
Go tell people that I'm king. Teach them to obey me as their king and baptize them. So we're, we're going to have a baptism this morning. We have some more in the second service. But I just want to remind you that uh, the reason we do that, uh, we, we do it for the person being baptized so that they can make a public declaration of their faith in Jesus. They are identifying with him. They are saying to you and to a watching world, uh, Jesus is their Lord, he is their Savior, and they want you and everyone else to know that. Uh, but you have a role in this also. Uh, you are, many of you, already followers of Jesus. You are the family of God. And so your role is to celebrate, to welcome them, and to affirm, yes, you are, in fact, part of God's family. So I'm going to invite Adam to come join me now. Uh, and I just, I, I say that to let you know that after uh, we baptize him, I expect you to celebrate. So. You've probably noticed, but uh, Adam's testimony, along with all the others for second hour, are in an insert in your bulletin, so we'd encourage you to read that. Adam's got a great testimony. Uh, Adam, I have a verse that I want to share with you this morning uh, for your baptism. It comes from Psalm 34, verses 4 through 6. It says this, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord answered him. He saved him out of all his troubles. Adam, is it your testimony here this morning before these brothers and sisters in Christ that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Yes, it is. Uh, is it your desire this morning to follow his example and command by being baptized? Yes. That it's my pleasure to baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. together with that, I want to invite us to all respond by standing and singing together this song of surrender.
celebrated baptism and I have to tell you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ you have received his forgiveness for your sins and you have yet to be baptized haven't taken that step I, I've got to ask why not we would love to uh, talk to you about what baptism is about and uh, be able to put together another opportunity to have a baptism service so I'd love to invite you to talk to one of the pastors on staff here at First Free I want to invite everyone following the service to join us, not running off to uh, some Easter brunch or something, to come down and join us for some coffee and donuts down in the gym as well following the service. This week, remember today, remember Easter. Remember what we have just celebrated. Remember that Jesus Christ is the final word. Let's receive benediction, sending prayer out of Hebrews. May the God of peace who the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from death, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. Might he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in his joy. Amen.